Welcome back to BJGH Education. My name is Stephen, and today we're continuing our series on the Acts of the Apostles. This is Acts chapter 25, verses 1 to 12, episode number 41, Pandering Politics. Now, previously, we talked about court corruption, and we were talking about Felix's court, Acts 24, 27. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Paul's Festus, and desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. Now, Felix knew that Paul was innocent. Why then did he leave Paul in prison for two years? He was hoping to get a bribe from Paul. He was a corrupt politician. Uh, now that his term as the procurator has come to an end and he was to be succeeded by Paul's Festus, he's trying to score political brownie points with the Jewish leadership by leaving Paul in prison. Uh, he was hoping for a favorable review by the Jewish leadership to his bosses. Uh, hopefully, he will get a favorable posting in the future and advance in his political career. Felix was hopeless. We cannot trust him. He was corrupt. Uh, hopefully, Paul's Festus would be a better leader. The, the fifth procurator of Judea, around the year 59. Uh, this is his coin, and uh, Persis Festus was described as a capable and honest administrator by historians, so that's a good start. Uh, but at the same time, his administration was complicated by rising anti-Roman sentiments. So he had to really thread the needle here, um, and it's not easy, because on the one hand, he needed to advance Roman interests, but on the other hand, uh, he need to ensure that this does not result in um, further aggravating uh, the situation with the Jewish people uh, because of rising anti-Roman sentiment. So it's not easy to balance uh, the two. And that really characterized his procuratorship. And we can get a sense of that uh, even in the text, Acts chapter 25. Let's take a look. Now, three days after Festus had arrived in the province, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. He's really a man on the go, uh, isn't he? Wasted no time to go up to Jerusalem to meet the Sanhedrin. He didn't stay in the uh, provincial palace in Caesarea for a long time, enjoying the facilities there, uh, dilly-dallying. He's all about the business. Just three days he arrived in the province, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. He's a go-getter, uh, he means business, uh, so we already like him. And the chief priests and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul. And they urged him, asking as a favor against Paul, that he summon him to Jerusalem, because they were planning an ambush to kill him on the way. Festus replied that Paul was being kept at Caesarea and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So, said he, let the man of authority among you go down with me, and if there's anything wrong about the man, let them bring charges against him. So, basically, Festus says no. He insisted for the case to be tried in Caesarea according to Roman law. He's a man of principles. He could not be easily bought. Uh, the Jewish leadership was hoping to um, pressure him a little. You are new here and the people don't really like you because you are a Roman procurator. We are the leaders of the Jewish people. You are going to be here for a couple of years and then you will go on to uh, your future post. Why make your life difficult here? Work with us, right? Give us Paul. Festa says, well... He was kept at Caesarea. And the fact that he knew about this uh, really showed that he's on top of his game. So he says, I'll stand on my principles. If he has committed a crime um, according to Roman law, then he must be tried in Caesarea. So after he stayed among them not more than eight or ten days, he didn't go for the, uh, uh, he didn't take his time enjoying uh, Jerusalem just within a, a a week, a week and a half, he went down to Caesarea. He's really, really efficient. 
And the next day, the next day, he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. When he had arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him. We don't have to uh, re-enumerate those. It has already been covered in the previous episode. Neither does uh, the author wants to um, rehash those charges against Paul, but simply that they could not prove their case against Paul. And likewise, without going through Paul's defense once again, uh, we just have a summary statement here. Paul argued in his defense, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I committed any offense. Suffice to say that Paul adequately defended himself against the trumped up charges. Now, Paul says, Festus is an intelligent man. He has heard the case against him, and he has heard the defense, and he knew that there was no case. And it is rather obvious. Paul knew it. He knew it. In fact, the Jewish leadership knew it. Why then did the Jewish leadership still bring these many and serious charges against Paul that could not be proven. Are they crazy? What's going on? Huh. Paul's Festus knew exactly what was going on. So, Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me. This is pathetic politics, pandering to the Jewish leadership. He says that the Sanhedrin wanted Paul for political reasons. There's no crime here. Everyone knows it. What is going on? The Jews were trying to pressure him uh, for political purposes. We are going to make your tenure here a living hell if you do not do, give, do not do us a favor here. So Festus says, Do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and then be tried on these charges before me? Forget about principles. Forget about the rule of law. Festus simply tried to curry favor with them by changing the venue to Jerusalem. But Paul said, um, frankly, he rebuked Festus. I am standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. This is the place. This is Caesarea. It's the competent court. Why am I going to Jerusalem? To the Jews, I have done no wrong, as you yourself know very well. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape death. But if there is nothing to the charges against me, no one can give me up to them. He insisted that his case be tried in Caesarea. Or since Festus couldn't give him a proper judgment, he says, I appeal to Caesar. I'm not getting anything done here. I've been in prison for two years over trumped up charges. Everybody knows what's going on, yet here we are. And now, uh, well, f well, the previous guy, Felix, he's a corrupt individual. You are supposed to be a man of principles, but if even you, a man of principles, a supposedly upright politician, uh, someone who is a competent man, yet here we are. So I appeal to Caesar. There's nothing to be gained in this court. Then Festus, when he had conferred with his counsel, answered, to Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you shall go. I will not make this my problem. And when you read this passage, you may feel, huh, you may feel let down by Festus. Maybe you think that Festus was sent by God, really, to, uh, to free Paul from imprisonment. Yet, what a disappointment. Process Festus was. And this reminds me of a psalm, Psalm 146. It says, Praise the Lord! 
Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes. Don't trust them. Mere human beings, mere mortals, they may mean well. They may seem to be men of principles, men and women of principles, yet, yet, when the rubber meets the road, when it is, uh, when the sticks are uh, very high, they're bound to disappoint you. Put not your trust in princes. Maybe they're not trustworthy, or maybe they're just simply incapable. Whatever the case may be, put not your trust in princes, in the son of man in whom there's no salvation. Why? Because when his breath departs, he returns to the earth. Just like every other human being, mortals. You're not all-powerful. You're not eternal. Uh, when his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Maybe he meant evil. Maybe he meant well. Maybe it was a brilliant plan. But on that very day, when his breath departs, his plans perish. Instead, who should we trust? We should trust in God. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. Not Felix, not Festus. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. So here's the lesson. Do not trust Felix. Do not trust Festus. They are just mortals. Trust in the Lord. God bless you.